Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. We have a great show lined up for you guys tonight. We are talking with a company called 23P, two of the folks who work there, Michael Belton and Dave Falkenstein. And I will let them introduce themselves, but these guys are a red teaming, pen testing, basically stuff that Adam and I are not experts in. And we have them on to give that perspective from the red team side on what they've seen and then how you can possibly protect your companies based on some of the war stories, which we'll hopefully get into towards the end here. But Michael, why don't you start it off and tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. Sure, awesome. And uh, thanks, Andy, for not uh, going with the Michael Bolton. I'd have to break out my office <laughs> space quotes. <laughs> so I uh, always appreciate that. Um, <laughs> I celebrate his entire library. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I, um, I started doing information security in the uh, mid to late 90s. Uh, I had a dial-up ISP with, uh, um, with my wife. And um, we also um, uh, offered security services on the side. So at that time, it was, you know, firewall management and setup and, and secure email services and things like that. Uh, we sold that company in 2000, and uh, I went into uh, training as a contractor for DOD. I taught offense and defense at uh, Fort McCoy and Fort Gordon. Um, from there, I went into consulting, uh, and I consulted with a company, a local company here in Madison, but also probably known nationally called Burby. Uh, Burby was later purchased by CDW to be their, their services wing. Um, after that, I went to Rapid7. I was global manager of the penetration testing team at Rapid7. I did that for several years. After that, I went. Uh, I was a VP, VP of R&D at Optiv, uh, where we focused on uh, vulnerability research and then applied research as well. That's what my team focused on. Um, from there, I took a little break and I taught at uh, local technical college, Madison College, for a few years, and uh, and then most recently um, started. Uh, 23P uh, to really focus on using offensive security as a not only a learning tool but also as a way to test standards that uh, that organizations might be uh, aligned to. Awesome! What a history! <laughs> Glad to have you on. Thank you, Dave. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Dave. Um, my history is not as epic as Mike's. I uh, got into working in tech around 2010 or so. I was doing tech support uh, at a game company called Square Enix. Uh, from there, I worked at a uh, ISP data center type place doing some Linux support uh, at a place called WebNX in Los Angeles. Uh, from there, I built up a, a decent skill set uh, using Linux and using tools like Metasploit. And uh, a company called Rapid7 had acquired Metasploit, uh, and they were looking for support engineers for Nexpos and Metasploit. I got super lucky and got a job there. Uh, and then from there, I got a phone call one day from Mike, who was like, hey, I heard, I heard you do some cool stuff sometimes. And uh, then I ended up on the penetration testing team at Rapid7. Uh, from there, I moved on to a few different places places. Uh, I worked at uh, a bank here in Los Angeles, City National Bank, on their red team. Uh, and then I went on to lead the red team over at a company called IOActive for a few years. Uh, and then now I'm over here at uh, 23P. So uh, basically about a decade of uh, offensive security experience. Awesome. Well, one of the things that I wanted to ask right away, because I do a lot of mentoring with new folks coming into security. And then Mike, with your education background, you were teaching folks getting into red teaming and security as well. Dave, I'm also interested in hearing what you have on this topic because you didn't start off in red teaming right away. You spent a few years in IT in general and then worked your way into red teaming. But when I talk to these new folks and I ask them, 
what is it that you want to do in security? Because there are so many different silos within security and what you can focus on. Almost all of them tell me that they want to do pen testing. They want to do red teaming. They want to hack into different companies and bug bounties and all that. They have this dream that that is exactly what they want to do. And I tried to dial them back and I'm like, well, you have zero experience, no certificates, and I'm not exactly sure what you're doing at home. Not to say that that's not possible. I'm sure there are people who are, you know, savants and like Neo in the Matrix that can just see the code and find the way in. But what would you say to those folks who are getting in and, and what's your experience of like, you know, maybe starting off in red teaming right away or building up that experience before you getting into red teaming? And I'll start with you, Mike. Sure. Um, so you're, you're right. Uh, just, just starting day one as a red teamer or even a, a penetration tester at a junior level is, is incredibly challenging from a career perspective, meaning it's um, in, in my general experience, it's, it's incredibly difficult unless you um, apply at a company that does some sort of technical interview where you get to demonstrate what you know. But um, I, I have interviewed many uh, potential red teamers and penetration testers in, over my career. Uh, talk is one thing. Uh, hands on keys is a totally different thing. And so... Um, and so for those reasons, right, it, it's a credibly challenging area of the industry to get into. Very rewarding, very fun, but uh, also very difficult. And uh, I, I think Dave would probably agree with me on this. Some of the best penetration testers I've ever known spent a lot of time previously as system administrators. And the reason I suggest that that is so is that um, when you're a system administrator, you think about all of the challenges involved with just operational IT, right? And so you're thinking about, okay, Oracle or you know SAP or whatever this enterprise grade software is, um, you know, it, it's complicated to set up, it's complicated to manage properly, and because of that, administrators tend to do X, Y, or Z. Maybe that's create a uh, a super admin account that's effectively a backdoor in case everything starts to go bad, right? And so because you have that experience, you start to look for those things as a red teamer or a pen tester. And I think that gives people an advantage uh, in this line of work. Mm -hmm. Dave, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I uh, 100 percent agree with Mike. Uh, I, I really try to guide people towards uh, being a sysadmin or even being a software developer first. Uh, the best uh, people I know in security, uh, they didn't go directly to security at all. They they spent years, uh, you know, building apps, whether it was web apps or uh, thick client apps, uh, you know, Windows applications, uh, game developers. I know like amazing hackers who spent years just you know doing game hacks for years. Um, I grew up, you know, playing with weird little things like that like making aim bots and stuff and it gave me an idea of how to work with you know certain APIs um, but but I think uh Going towards things that you're actually interested in makes a big difference. People want to hop into security and, and they don't really know what they want to do. But if you're like, hey, I, I really like playing with iPhones or I, I really like writing malware or, or whatever is the case, uh, you'll find niches that kind of help you grow and it, it grows a bit more organically and you have a passion for it versus sitting there and struggling to learn something like, oh, Active Directory, when I hate Active Directory, I don't want to sit there and play with Active Directory all day. I, I'd rather have someone who specializes in that skill set um, or who actually has has fun setting those things up. And, and you do need to learn these things as a consultant. Like I've definitely set up AD myself and I've, I've worked at a few places where I've had to set up AD environments, um, but I loved Linux. So I, I went around, you know, learning about Chef and Puppet and Ansible and all these things. And so that's like the skill set that now I'm able to bring to the table as a red teamer is like, I can be the Linux admin, I can set up the infrastructure and I can leave the AD stuff to someone else who has that skill set, or I can focus on malware development or, or other things. Um, does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool, cool. Um, kind of curious, Mike, you brought up technical interviews. Have either of you ever had to demonstrate in technical interview, like hack on the fly type stuff, or maybe over a weekend? Yeah, speaking for myself, definitely. Uh, at, at every job that, that I was in, except for the, uh, the training in DOD, uh, all the consulting positions, uh, the VP role, the um, management role, uh, I had to demonstrate that 
uh, I knew what I was talking about, right? And that that whether you're on the delivery side, meaning you're a practitioner, or whether you're on the management side, if you don't speak the language, if you don't understand the fundamentals of what it is that that offensive brings to the table, right? It, um, it, it's um, it's an incredibly challenging situation. So yes, I've been tested, and you know, in my last employer, for example, when I was a VP at Optive, um, the R and D team, we put together a uh, an embedded device that we would send to candidates. They'd have a week to crack it. The embedded device uh, challenge would involve uh, reversing some firmware, stealing some secrets from hardware. Uh, there was an API that was involved and a web application associated with the API. And each of those had flags that you had to capture. And so it's a mini CTF with a, with a piece of hardware that we would send you. Um, and uh, in my general experience, that's what these are. They're not necessarily like, oh, just show up and you know hack stuff. It's more, we're going to set up a CTF for you. Here are some of the guardrails. Here are some of the boundaries of the CTF. You know, it'll happen in four days, and be prepared. And you know, then we give the candidate a Kali machine, for example. Super cool. So. Looking at the type of people who might be interested, there's definitely some traits and personality types that tend to be more red teaming. I know in my background, having been in the military, having been in law enforcement, I definitely have a defender's mindset. It was very difficult for me to think about the different ways to get in to, you know, on a, like a red teaming. So what are some personality traits or um you know just ways of thinking that a, a good red teamer might have yeah Dave, i'll start with you <laughs> oh i'm sorry sure uh, i can go into it so i would say uh, i generally look for a few things passion and and you know creativity uh, i look for people who have that kind of evil bit but are not actually evil people um and so they kind of have that bit set in them where they, where they're looking for a little mischief right they they've you know maybe played with uh, breaking into a few buildings or smuggling a few items through tsa or something um, pe people who like to get around uh, certain laws but uh, don't want to live that lifestyle perhaps um, or, or just people that are just super passionate and uh, want to do this type of work um, I've, I've met people from all walks of life who like to do red team work uh, people who are ex-military like yourself uh, people who are ex-criminals um, and, and everything in between um, I've, I've done red team work with uh, someone who used to you know, do tons of like card forgery and they actually got arrested by law enforcement for all the forgery they did, um, but I did red team work, and, and we had him, you know, forge badges with us. Um, so it it, uh, it varies, but I, I just say creativity and someone who just has fun. Um, I don't like to be super serious when we're doing this type of work, uh, and also someone who is aware of their surroundings and safety. Um, when we do red team work, I, I like to do scenarios that really blend in, and like we're not wearing like tons of tactical gear or anything like that. Um, I'm, I'm more likely to dress up like an ATM technician. Uh, and so people who uh, have that kind of uh, safety mentality and are aware of the situations that they create at an organization so that we're not creating more risk when we execute red team engagements. Um, so there's quite a few variables that go into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just Mike, follow on Mike, sorry to that. cut you off there. <laughs> go ahead, Mike. Uh, I was just going to say, I would just add on to that by saying that um, if you think of a uh, if you think of red and blue in terms of uh, musicians, for example, right? Um, a, a blue teamer to me is more of a classical artist, meaning blue teaming is really built around um, checklists and guidelines and right. NIST is our Bible. Uh, ISO 27001 is a Bible. And, and so we think in terms of defense as a series of of checklists and best practices and we're trying to implement those in a repeatable auditable way so that we can build a baseline for security whereas a red teamer is more of a jazz musician in that you really um to my mind you really have to have the mentality not only to be creative and to think about okay what do i need to do to make my malware execute on this platform but then also think about 
um, uh, the idea that it's not going to come to you right away, right? You have to have that stick to itiveness, if I can abuse the language in that way, to say, all right, this thing that I just did didn't work. And, you know, four hours later, you're still pounding on it. And then at four, four hours, 35 minutes, the aha moment happens and you succeed, right? But if you're, if you're not driven by the, by the cause, so to speak, if you're not driven by the problem itself, it's really easy to get burnt out in, in pen testing or red teaming because we're doing things that you're not supposed to do, right? That's the whole point of this is to test your security mm -hmm. controls in ways that you didn't think of. And if that doesn't get your juices flying, it's gonna be very hard to, to really excel in a, in a red or penetration testing environment. Yeah, j just like Mike's saying, and I kind of pivot off of that, the ability to like learn from our failures and having that tenacity to kind of keep going in the face of adversity is a big part of red teaming. Like we'll have times where our malware fa fails in the face of EDR or our phishing campaign might be detected, and you have to learn how to pivot off of that or create a different scenario on the fly. Um, and, and so that's a big part of the skill set. Man, I really identified with your music analogy because <laughs> I am a classical violinist and I do really well at learning classical music and playing it, but I'm really bad <laughs> at jam sessions when people are like, oh, let's just jam and go on the fly. I can't do that. Um, I can't create my own music just off of the fly like that. Um, my kids are in fiddling and that's what jamming is is listening and being able to key off of it and they're really good at it they're very creative but i am not so i really identify with that analogy and how people think because yeah coloring within the lines is like what i do <laughs> and maybe uh you know if you don't have that personality and you're a little bit more mischiev mischievous like you said david um you know the uh that may be something that will steer you towards red teaming. Yeah, and, and for the record, actually, I cannot color inside the lines. I'm terrible, so I think there is a correlation there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You mentioned something, Dave, that was also interesting to me because, again, there's these different silos in security, and when we think red teaming, we often think, you know, the guy in the hoodie, gal in the hoodie at the keyboard – hammering away trying to hack into some you know network hack but you Gibson. mentioned yeah exactly you mentioned the guy that you worked with that forged badges and that brings up physical security too and that's a specialty probably within um within pen testing social engineering and uh physical security and you know i wanted to hear your thoughts on on physical security and social engineering but also your thoughts on how, you know, in this day and age, have you thought about, especially as a company owner, Mike, how race has played into possibly physical pen testing because there was those folks who were arrested in the South and they were both African American. They were part of a pen testing team and they were maybe treated a little bit more with, you know, a little bit with more scrutiny than if it was someone who was white who was breaking in you know they were they were tasked to do this they had contracts to do it but when the police showed up you know they were arrested and, and put in the handcuffs so you know how does that play into the safety of your employees if you're thinking about physical security um and uh yeah i just wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that yeah um uh, mike you want to start off no please go ahead dick Sure. So going into just like safety protocols, we try to be just as safe as possible with our scenarios. And so we, we first try to come up with the scenarios that are extremely believable. Maybe we're the IT staff showing up. Uh, and actually, one of my favorite things to do is pretend to be an incident responder. So I pretend to be a blue team person. And uh, I do a spoofed phone call to an organization, perhaps. And I say, hey, you know, there's been an incident at this organization. Uh, we're going to send a blue teamer there and uh, just be ready for them to, you know, get access to what they need to. Uh, and then we'll have someone else on site who isn't even a part of the scenario, but is just watching for anything bad that can happen, just like you're saying. Law enforcement getting confused, uh, 
you know, people at the company getting confused, any of that. And so if, if that does happen, we do have a third party that can kind of walk up sometimes and be like, hey, you know what, this is actually part of our scenario. Like there's a huge misunderstanding. Um, but also you yourself having, you know, that vocabulary and that ability to stay cool. Um, I, I am, you know, have had various times where I've been sitting inside of a bank that I've broken into and uh, I am freaking out inside like, hey, they're going to call the cops. I'm going to get arrested. Uh, someone's going to beat the crap out of me. Um, this is a bad situation. And I just have to stay cool and just sit there and wait it out. Um, and at worst, I've had a security guard show up. I haven't been arrested um, yet, thank goodness. Um, but, but I think having those safety protocols and, and just like uh, we think about defense in depth for defending an organization, we have this kind of defense in depth protocol for protecting us uh, in the event of any uh, weird situations like this. Um, Mike, would you like to go into that side of it a bit? And then I can go into, uh, I guess, some red team engagements uh, further where I've done some physical work as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. And I, I think you hit on the, the core point that I would like to make as well. I, I don't know that it's necessarily uh, that, that race necessarily has an impact on, on any of this. It's really boils down to professionalism and protocol at the end of the day. And I, I know the incident you mentioned, I don't know specifics about it, so I can't really speak to it. But I can say that, um, that if you're in a situation where law enforcement has been contacted, right, you've already probably committed a series of mistakes to get to that point beyond just getting caught, right? Um, your protocol would dictate that you have, a, 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 you know, some sort of physical auditable document that outlines who your content, your emergency contact is and, and why you're there. And it's on comp your, you know, your target company's letterhead, et cetera, et cetera. Um, obviously, as with any law enforcement interaction, being polite and respectful, um, it, it goes a long way towards success. And so to my mind, uh, you know, I have been caught certainly doing red team, physical red team work. Um, uh, I actually once got locked in a stairwell and the only way I could get out was either to trigger the fire alarm or to just call and say, you know, the jig's up. So, um, so those, these things happen, right? But how you handle it, right, is really the most important. It's, um, uh, you know, it. I like to say it doesn't matter that you made a mistake. It's how you, you know, how you deal with it that matters the most. And I think that rings true here. And, and certainly there are situations where if you are now involved with law enforcement, where I'm sure race has some sort of coloring factor, I haven't, you know, and I've, I've uh, managed very diverse teams. I haven't heard of that being an issue outside of the very public one you mentioned, but it is a, uh, it is an interesting thought, certainly. I, but again, I think professionalism trumps any of that. Um, in general. Yeah, and also another point is like, don't run around in like a ski mask and tactical gear when you're doing <laughs> red team stuff. Uh, when, when we do it, we, we do the situations where we pose as the blue team or we pose as uh, some kind of enterprise person that, you know, may be there, even a janitor or something. Uh, we're not showing up in tactical gear. We're not kicking down doors. Uh, occasionally, we use things like the under the door tool and stuff, but a lot of times we're just tailgating in uh, and we just look like another employee. And so, you know, if very odd for someone to just call the police on someone it's like hey this guy's in the office and he looks like he shouldn't be there versus okay this guy's walking out with 10 computers this is strange um and so it all depends on the activity that you're doing and, and, and how you present yourself um yeah yeah awesome so final thing on training when someone's trying to get into red teaming any type of training or certifications that you would recommend? Because I'm sure there's people who are listening to this podcast who might have thought about getting into red teaming at some point. Where should they be focusing on training and possibly any good cert certs in the industry that you would recommend? Sure. So uh, my mindset on that is train in whatever you suck really bad at. If, if you have a background that you're really weak in, I would say target that. And so for myself, I had more of a sysadmin background and I wasn't really a software developer. So I went after trainings that helped me grow in that field. And so uh, there's like the dark side ops courses where it's like focused on malware development. Uh, that's a great one. I believe that was under Silent Break Security that moved on to NetSpy. 
Uh, there's also the Sector 7 courses focused on malware development. There's the Maldev Academy that's out there currently. So I, I like to focus on malware development and uh, offensive tool development now um, because that's kind of where I'm personally weakest. Um, there's other great uh, trainings that I've taken, uh, vulnerability research red team operators from Spectre Ops. Um, there's BC Security uh, courses just on, you know, using Empire. Uh, Spectre Ops also has a course on, on, you know, just managing a red team operation. I believe Darkside Ops even has one. But really, I, I think the mindset that should be, you know, get stronger in things that you're weak in. And so if you, you know, suck at operational infrastructure, maybe go look at a course like uh, CRTO or, or something that has some kind of Terraform, uh, you know, built into the curriculum. Uh, if you suck as a developer, go target that training. Um, but do things that you're interested in and that you have a passion for. Otherwise, you'll just kind of sit there and bang your head all day. Um, yeah, awesome. and I, I would I would uh, build on that a little bit. My uh, my experience is teaching at uh, Madison College, for example, two year technical college. The first year is all fundamentals, operating system fundamentals, command line things like that. And and then um, you know my counterpart when I taught there was focused on defense. I was focused on offense. And but but you can't even begin to start to think about those uh, those concepts or those topics until you have that that base fundamental um and so a, a two-year course like that is a great place to start quite frankly um beyond that you know if you're thinking about uh just sort of general sort of net pen based uh you know uh sort of training i really love the oscp course um it's a it's a certification. It's probably the only certification I look for in a in a in a prospect. You right in a potential employee, um, because the the whole attitude behind offensive security's approach to OSCP and their other certs, but OSCP in particular, is really um, is is incorporates that stick to itiveness. Right, their their motto is you you send them a, a help email, you get something back that just says try harder. That's their approach. It's a brutal approach, but it uh, it really does separate those who really want this from those that don't. And uh, and so if you're thinking about certification, it's a mountain to climb. Don't get me wrong, but OSCP is certainly something that I uh, value as a uh, as a hiring manager. Michael, I was going to make the same point you did about that kind of base level of knowledge, that fundamental education. I had um. My employer, Microsoft, paid for my everyone in my role. We all had to go get certified ethical hacker, and this is like four or five years ago. And it was about 10 years in the industry for me. And what amazed me about going through that course um, was how much assumptive knowledge there was built into it, that you understood how operating systems worked. You understood how TCP IP worked. You understood how network worked. And if you didn't walk in the door with a pretty fundamental understanding of here's what a packet is, you know, and, and here's these sorts of things. Like it wasn't going to teach you that you had to have that coming in the door. So there's just a certain amount of, depending on, on who we're talking to as a theoretical future red teamer, where you're at in career, some of it is you just have to be around technology. You have to get that base level of knowledge of how all the stuff works and how all the stuff fits together before you can start to figure out how to break it and how to pull it back apart. You have to understand how the pieces fit together first. And so I, I just wanted to plus one on your comment around that fundamental level of knowledge is you do have to build that first. And however you're going to get that, whether that's industry experience, whether that's accelerated learnings, um, you, you do have to understand all that too and, and be able to basically understand how computers and technology and networking works before you can figure out how to pull it back apart. Yeah, that's a great perspective. I like to say you need to know the rules before you can break them. And if you don't know the you rules, go. you're just, you know, you just spray and pray. And that's yeah. no way to hack. Yeah, it was really funny because I would ask some of these mentees that would, you know, tell me that they wanted to be red teamers. And I'd be like, OK, well, what's the name of the administrator that has, you know, complete control in an active directory domain that you want to get? And they couldn't tell me, you know, they're like the administrator. I'm like, well, okay, well, what is it called? And they couldn't name it. You know, it's like, okay, well, you should probably understand the fundamentals of AD, you know, before you can actually be a red teamer. So, yeah. And then beyond that, the, the blue team perspective of, right. Who, who would have domain, right. 
who has domain admin and what is that account named? I mean, if there's not the defaults, if you're following any reasonable set of uh, blue, you know, mm -hmm. blue operational perspective. So you also have to not be tripped up by, oh, it's not the default, so I don't know what to do anymore. And that's an experience thing, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, let's talk about some war stories because I'm sure you have some really good ones on how you have gotten into companies having been doing red teaming and pen testing for many years, misconfigurations, ways that you've defeated physical security, um, stuff like that. So I think our audience would love to hear um, ways that you've gotten in and then maybe recommendations that you had for those companies to help them secure it in the future. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the misconfigurations. I uh, I just presented on this exact topic at Black Hat last week, and um, um, there are so many stock default configurations or misconfigurations that you'll find that, uh, I mean, we could, we could do a show just on that. So I'll keep it very high level. Um, we actually are putting out a document on our website that that calls out a variety of categories and, and provides some some things to look out for. But, you know, networking protocols in particular are super hot. So like LLMNR, MDNS, right? The uh, SMB, a lot of the standard Microsoft protocols come into play when you're talking about relaying credentials or stealing them off the wire. Um, you know, password policies, again, at a high level, um, the idea that a longer password is better than a complex password. So one thing I used to tr train on uh, in DOD was uh, for officers, um, you know, think about a very long password. Think about a passphrase, right? The, the familiar term we all use, which to me means, you know, grab a book off your shelf, know the chapter and the page or just the page number and know that it's going to be the first sentence. And that first sentence is your password. Because if you think about the economics of a password cracking venture, the shorter the password, the quicker it is for you to try more permutations. The longer it is, um, the more CPU cycles, the costlier it is for you to crack that. And Dave can provide more guidance, I'm sure, but that at a high level, uh, some of my thoughts on that. So again, we could have a whole show just on misconfigurations and how red teams abuse them. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll just kind of I'll pause there. <laughs> Dave, some wisdom, please. <laughs> Yeah, so general misconfigurations I've seen recently are like MFA not being implemented on all portals, uh, being able to use like graph API to get around certain conditional access policies. Um, I've seen a lot of failures in conditional access policies. Uh, Whitelisting where people have very complex uh, EDR configurations and deployments, but then they'll have a huge group of software developers who had to, you know, whitelist everything or create these huge folders where everything's whitelisted. And it's uh, pretty funny because I'll spend like, you know, two weeks of dev time like writing some sick custom malware uh <laughs> writing some kit, some sick stager that like bypasses everything and then i get to the client and they're like oh yeah we have crowdstrike but we we whitelisted everything and it's like oh well i just wasted all this time um so i, I think those are the most brutal misconfigurations where even i as a, a red team where i'm like why am i even trying um but but in general um yeah, it's uh, it's tough to you know be on top of everything, and so I understand from the other side. And, and also, the defaults can be pretty nasty, uh, like um, Azure uh, Portal that has it like the defaults where you can just kind of see everyone's workstation, you can see everyone's username uh, just as a regular user. And, and so I think those kind of defaults that get implemented on all of those services are also pretty scary. Um, yeah. So you're able to just enumerate right there as a regular user. Exactly. I don't need to go through a whole mess of command line uh, flags and, and you know burn the opsec of the operation. I can just log into the Azure portal and uh, get everything I need right there. Yeah, there is a configuration for our listeners, if you're not aware, that you can block the Azure portal for the majority of your users, except for the ones that you might actually need to use Azure for. And there's also a conditional access analyzer that can show you the gaps that you have and that's that's a common thing that i think um we've seen as well where people have conditional access scoped but then there'll be gaps and so there there is a built-in tool in azure that can show you what application or user whatever it is that um, is exempt from your conditional access rules 
Let's talk about physical security. That's always a fun topic. Let's let's hear some more stories on that. Sure. Um, Mike, you want to go into one or should I start? No, please. Nail it. Cool. So, yeah, I've done a few physical engagements. Uh, having a background in finance, I got tasked with uh, robbing a few banks. Um, and so that was uh, quite a bit of fun. Uh, and uh, I can go into the tactics that I used for a few of those. Uh, one method that was really fun, and it was actually pivoting off of a failed social engineering campaign. Um, and so this is kind of going back to that mentality of even if you have something that fails, you can learn to use that, right? And so we had this mass campaign of giving out free sports tickets to people and saying, hey, you know, we, the bank, are giving out free tickets to a football game to our employees. Click here to sign up. Um, various people did click on it, but then a huge you know, mass email from the bank went out after that saying, hey, everyone be on the lookout. That was a phishing campaign. And then so the team was like, oh, man, we're burned. Like, we're screwed. They, they saw that. Everyone's going to be on alert. And I was like, well, we can perhaps use that, right? We have inside knowledge. There, there's an email that we know that people clicked on and people are freaking out about and everyone's talking about. Um, so we can use that knowledge. And then I had done quite a bit of reconnaissance. And I had, you know, got an idea of the org map, right? Who's who and, and who's the manager and, and who's the CTO and who would send out a blue team. And so uh, what I did is I uh, spoofed a phone call to a bank and I said hey this is the CTO um, I'm sending an incident response team I'm sure you saw that email that was going around that phishing email someone at your branch clicked on that email we're sending a team of incident responders a blue team to go and look at your workstation do forensics um, let them access whatever they need and they bought that story a hundred percent and so uh, wow. you know my, my Myself, another associate, we went to another branch and we got business cards. We got an idea of you know what you know how they work a little bit. And uh, I actually just went to a copy shop and I just forged my own business card for that you know company. And so now I've got a fake business card. And then I also went and I printed out a fake email from that CTO saying, "Here's the work order. Here's what you guys need to do. Here's you know the incident." And made it look as official as possible. Got the clipboard. Um, you know, wore a polo shirt. You know, as legit as possible. And we also forged badges. We had fake badges for the bank. And so we have lanyards with fake badges. We have business cards. We have a work order. We have a spoofed call to the bank branch. Uh, quite a believable situation, right? Uh, so we just show up and say, hey, we're the IR guys. We know about this email. Uh, someone at your branch clicked it. You know, let us into your back office. Let us into whatever. And uh, what we did is we implanted a Raspberry Pi with a transparent bridge. Uh, that was to bypass NAC and to uh, sniff everything going across the wire so basically like a wiretap for a computer right and we actually uh, had a 4g modem connected to that as well that was just sniffing everything and then passing that back to a vps uh, that we controlled so it was a pretty pretty basic setup but it did work and uh, with that we were able to grab the credentials for a bank manager um, but there's mfa and there's no externally accessible portals right there's there's nothing that we could use externally with these credentials so i had to breach yet another corporate facility Facility. And uh, I did that in a few different ways. Uh, I did that via tailgating during a fire drill. I had intelligence that there was a fire drill going on. And so I just walked into a uh, office that was unused, sat down at a desk with that bank manager's credentials, and I had access to, you know, millions of dollars in, in assets. I could, you know, move money around as I wanted. Um, and it was a really cool show of, you know, even though you have all these external things um, with a little bit of social engineering and uh, just looking the part and playing the part, uh, you can get pretty far. And uh, so that was like a full compromise of those assets. Uh, other things we did were, you know, breaches of their data center with a UDT. So I uh, actually did a lot of recon on one of their facilities, which had their data center and their SOC. And I had seen that they were open at night and they had a cleaning crew that liked to leave the door open. And so this cleaning crew likes to leave all the door open, doors open. And uh, so we just show up at night pretending to be the blue team again and uh, just walk around. And we actually found the, the door to the sock wide open. And so we were able to walk into the SOC and take pictures of their analysis dashboards, like everything that there's going on. Um, but we, we had a ridiculous amount of access just through, you know, lack security policies and all that fun stuff. Um, and, and people just not vetting who's calling them and, and these kind of weak processes and, and kind of a culture of being super friendly. Th this bank had this huge policy of we want to be friendly to everyone. We don't want to be mean. And, and so by kind of exploiting that and being friendly with everyone, uh, they, they kind of just constantly 
instantly let us in, and uh, all we had to do was communicate communicate clearly and uh, be friendly. Uh, it was uh, super fun. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, it's it's that's a crazy story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that was a fun one. Um, Mike, do you have any other fun physicals or? Yeah, I have one that I think is probably worth mentioning. This happened in D.C. In a, in a, in a, with a very mature customer in a very mature facility. And this speaks to our earlier conversation about protocol and, and politeness. But um, uh, there were only two people at the organization that knew we were going to be doing this. And they had set the challenge out for us, again, because they were very mature in their operational security. The challenge was to literally every night break into the facility. We didn't, we weren't allowed in, we had to get into the facility just so we could start to do the cyber side of the house, right? And so um, uh, a few days of recon before that, taking pictures of badges, creating those, everything that Dave just went through. Um, and, uh, and we were getting in every night. And of course we were, um, uh, and the reason I wanna tell the story is uh, we were looking for other ways in, right? How can we get in without having to show badges and, you know, really more of a high profile approach? How can we kind of come in through a back door, so to speak? And uh, while we were doing that, we we're walking down a hallway and there was a small door, um, you know, like a two, two, two and a half foot high door. And it was about waist high in a hallway. And on the door, it said John Malkovich's head. John Malkovich, of course, the actor. <laughs> And uh, and what an odd, obscure door. So it's locked, of course. So we picked the lock, opened the door, empty. So disappointed with such a great name on the outside. Uh, but yeah, there was nothing in there, unfortunately. Um, so that one stands out because we had a potential to see John Malkovich's head, but it wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well... Let's talk about 23P. I want to give you guys a little bit of time, certainly to for one, to thank you for taking the time out to come on our show and, and talk about red teaming. But you guys are a local company. Michael, I know that you're local to Madison, Wisconsin, where I live. and um, But I'm sure you guys do engagements all over the place. So um, tell us a little bit about 23P, what you guys bring to the table, Kind of your philosophy behind pen testing and maybe um, the after actions and how you help companies secure after you've done the pen testing yeah absolutely well and thank you very much for the opportunity to be on the podcast it's a great show uh, i've watched many of your episodes and um that said um 23p you're right we're uh, we're we're a madison based company dave is in los angeles um so we have people around the united states we have global customers um and uh and so we're we're really adaptable regardless of your maturity level whether you're uh, a, a very uh, basic sort of security posture or whether you have uh, what i had just described earlier in dc where you're you're doing everything and you really want to test hard um, I think one thing that really separates us is our, you know, partly our passion for offensive, but then also the idea that offensive shouldn't just be, okay, you came in and you hacked a bunch of stuff and you wrote a report and it has recommendations, but, you know, I, I don't really see a lot of business value in that, right? And, and I'm really not a big fan of sort of checkbox pen testing where it's minimal effort sort of uh, engagement. And it's really just sort of being done to to check off a box for some sort of compliance, right? And so, so what we try to do is we we have sort of two differentiators. Um, one of them is that our red team assessments, um, our penetration testing engagements, are rooted in some sort of standard. And uh, my favorite story to tell is of a customer that uh, is actually IPO'd. And because of the industry they were in, they had never had, uh, outside of a very rudimentary penetration test, they had never really tested their security. And they didn't really have a, a very mature program. And so we bound our testing to um, a security standard, right? A set of standards that we had defined. Um, in this case, we started with CSC 20. And, uh, and all of our testing efforts were focused around validating whether they uh, could adhere to or, or demonstrate capabilities that match CSC 20. 
And, um, and so we helped that customer go from a very immature security program to what is now a, a pretty modern and secure program with short reaction times, high visibility, all of those metrics that you look for in a good program. And so, so the other thing that we really bring to the table is our purple team engagements. Uh, the purple team engagements, we have something that we call a live fire replay. And so basically we'll come in and we do a red team engagement. We write our report, we make our observations, and then we come back after the fact with the purple team perspective, which is leveraging my, uh, my time as a trainer and as a teacher to, to structure daily um, classes around each event. So let's say um, we had credential relaying and, and so we would do a whole day of classes on credential relaying. We would offer your company time to for your employees to meet, whether that involves network ops and system administrators, whoever. Right, we help sort of guide that so that you get the most impact out of it. Rather than just dropping a report full of lulls on your desk, uh, we really want to help you grow. And if you're not using offensive to grow, it's, you know, um, I don't think you're making the most of your investment. And, and we really try to make sure that there's business value associated with all these engagements. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys for taking time out on a Sunday night to talk with us. It is, I think when we think red teaming, you know, it is those great war stories that Dave painted. And I think the conversation in the beginning reminds everyone that there is a lot of hard work in the basics, the fundamentals to get there. But if you're really interested, it can be, pretty exciting i think absolutely we're always looking for good people so <laughs> well thanks again for coming on tonight hopefully our listeners learned a little bit about red teaming and your company that's our show for this week thanks for watching and listening as always our contact information will be in the show notes as well as 23p's website and their contact info if you guys have any questions or topics you want us to talk about in the future, please let us know. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJAW0 and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.